practices such as um, virginity testing to breast ironing, the female genital mutilation. Dr. Blessing, with all these shouts and advocacies and uh, discussions and condemnation, these are still prevalent, cutting across countries, cultures, religion, ethnicities, and socioeconomic levels, even religion, and so forth. How do we really deal? Well, I, it's, it's really um, it's a hard one. In fact, I was surprised to learn that in Scotland, child marriages exist. You know, so it's not something limited to just developing countries. Uh, we, we still have a lot to do. Female genital mutilation is barbaric. Uh, we need to understand that we are reducing ourselves to mere animals when we do these things. And then mm. what about the risks associated? Maybe we need to blow the trumpet on the risks associated, but who cares? Mm. Because in most instances, because I don't know, they consider the girl child as less human. In these communities, in these communities where the practice is, they don't care about the outcome for the girl child. If you see what some girls go through in the name of uh, female genital mutilation, oh, for, uh, testing, you would, you would, it's, it's horrific. In the words of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, a Nigerian writer and feminist, she once said, We teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to them, or we say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful. Otherwise, you will threaten the man. Because I am a female, I'm expected to aspire to marriage. I'm expected to make my life choices, always keeping in mind that marriage is the most important. We should all be feminist. That's a lengthy one, but good. All right, let's take our second one. And this one is from Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Liberian politician who served as the 24th president of Liberia from 2006 to 2018. Sirleaf was the first elected female head of state in Africa. Big one, yeah? She said, To girls and women everywhere, I issue a simple invitation. My sisters, my daughters, my friends, find your voice. That's a strong one. I love this one. Our next one is from Desmond Tutu. So let's take the ones from the he's for she's. Desmond Tutu, a South African Anglican bishop and theologian known for his work as an anti apartheid and human rights activist. He once said, if we are going to see real development in the world, then our best investment is women. And that was loud. The women part was loud. Our last one is from Nelson Mandela, South African anti-apartheid activist who served as the first president of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. He was the country's first black state and first elected in a fully representative democratic election. He once said, as a tribute to the legions of women who navigated the path of fighting for justice before us, we ought to imprint in the supreme law of the land Firm principles upholding the rights of women. Awesome. I love this quote. Now let's see how all of this relates to what we'll be discussing tonight. Very warm greetings and welcome to D Conversation. We're reaching you from Captain's Television Studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Annabelle Oji. Now every day, hundreds of thousands of girls around the world are harmed physically or psychologically with the full knowledge and consent of their families, their friends, communities. And without urgent action, the situation is likely to worsen. A number of girls around the world go through humongous human rights violations and the inhumane practices ranging from son preference to early child marriage, rape, um, honor killing, sexual harassment, bully, teen pregnancy, maternal death, number of women in parliament and so forth that's just to mention a few how about the um famous 
female genital mutilation that has refused to go with the days of our forefathers and you'd be shocked to know that these practices are generally not performed out of malice rather they are seen as being in the best interest of the family or in the best interest of the girl herself even when she was not given the right of first refusal now these harmful practices are widespread, cutting across countries, cultures, religions, ethnicities, and socioeconomic levels. And you'll be shocked to know that some of the most revered countries where you would think that they should know better to protect these girls from such harmful practices are neck deep and have their whole hands served in the cookie jar. Countries such as... Um, for stories about uh, FGM, that's the female genital mutilations, you find them in countries such as Colombia, Indonesia, and um, Tanzania. And accounts of sun preference you find in um, Azerbaijan and India. Even our dear African countries, Nigeria. It is sad. So, on the show today, as Nigeria joins the rest of the world to commemorate International Day of the Girl Child, themed, our time is now. Our rights our future. We lend our voice and our effort here in the studio with my guest on the show today, Dr. Blessing Agbo Ntamu. She is a doctor of educational psychology, University of uh, Calabar. She's a bilingual, that's French and English, counselor and psychotherapist, humanitarian, author and gender-based violence expert. Dr. Blessing will be joining us virtually via Skype after this time out then afterwards we will definitely have um, Zitchat Noro and her mom Linda Dong as we will be commemorating International Day for the Girl Child. Today is the day for the girl child. Are you a girl child or are you a supporter of the girl child? Now this is your show. Let the conversation begin after this time out. If you just joined us, this is The Conversation. We are reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. Now it's time to uh, go straight to our interview for today or our chat for today. Our guest on the show tonight is Dr. Ntamo Blessing. She is a gender-based violence expert. It's good to have you on the show, ma'am. My pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Now let's get straight to our topic for today, International Day of the Girl Child. Why is it so important to set aside a particular day, that's the October, October um, 11th, to commemorate this day? Well, because ordinarily the rights of the girl child, you know, they are overlooked. So this is the day, setting aside this day helps us to emphasize the rights of the girl child help us to emphasize the challenges faced by the girl child. It also, it also offers us an opportunity to create um, awareness amongst the public on the rights of the girl child, on gender inequality issues. You know, it helps us to mobilize political will, you know, and then resources to respond to the challenges of the girl child and create more opportunities for the girl child. So setting aside this day, makes all this possible, without which most of these um, are overlooked. Mm. All right. Now, in the last 10 years, there have been increased attention on issues that matter to girls amongst um, government, policymakers, advocates like you and the general public, and more opportunities for girls to have their voices heard on the global stage. But yet, investment in girls' rights remain limited, and girls continue to confront a myriad of challenges to fulfilling their potential. So, would you actually say that girls are better off now? They definitely are better off now. And but even though they are better off now, there's still a lot to be done. You know, there's still a, a lot of grounds to be covered. You know, in the last century, we had a situation where girls couldn't vote. You know, um, talking about women's rights generally, you know, and the gender-based violence issues were silent. Young girls saw these issues as normal. But now there's an increase in awareness and many girls are becoming more aware of their rights. When they are undergoing violence and abuse, they are aware that this is violence and abuse. And so that gives them an impetus to resist, you know, violence, to sue for their rights and all of this. These were not available in time past. There are also policies that have been passed, laws that have been passed that are better, you know, the plight of the girl child. For instance, in my state where I am, in Cross River State, 
in December of 2021, we passed the VAP law, Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law, and that, you know, um, encompasses some of the rights of the girl child and also, uh, you know, uh, provides for, um, you know, uh, prosecuting perpetrators of violence against girls. So I would say that definitely uh, the plight of the, the girl child has bettered, you know, over the decade, but then there's still a lot of grounds to be covered. We are not there yet by any means. Mm. All right. Now, increasing resources for an investment in adolescent girls is one of the call to action for this year's um, International Day for the Girl Child. But then, over time, there have been the issue of stigmatization against the girl or the girl, uh, girl child. Now, especially in particular, some particular region, which where, where the, it's also known as a son preference or inheritance rights. When a man has girls, they say um, the girls are half current, but when he has boys, they call it full current and all of that. And then the girls are not allowed to speak or when they, they, at the death of the father, they are not allowed to inherit anything. Even up till now, when they can see the humongous development from people like um, uh, the Dora Okonyilis, the Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, the uh, Chimamanda Adichie, ha um, Hillary Clinton, and just to mention a few. So is it possible to end this violence and inhumane act against the girl child? I think it's very possible, and that's why we're working endlessly, you know, a lot of awareness campaigns and value orientation is necessary. You know, our society is patriarchal and it's not limited to our society. Worldwide, uh, gender-based violence and um, girls' rights are being violated, you know, but awareness campaigns, value reorientation re re rather. And I'm thinking that one way, you know, to achieve a lot of success will be working with secondary schools. And okay. like I said, we have to shift our focus a bit from, you know, it's good to focus on the girl child, but who perpetrates violence against the girl child? You know, it's the males, the boys mm -hmm. and the men. So we have to take our campaigns and awareness campaigns to the male population. That's why my call to action for me and my organization in this time is to do a lot of awareness campaigns among secondary school boys, adolescent boys. By the okay. time they know, they grow up knowing that, you know, these things are, uh, they are violation of rights. They are even criminal activities, uh, some of the uh, uh, gender issues that girls face, that they are more in a place to, you know, change their actions and change, you know, when we change their belief system, it will lead to a change in action. You know, so a lot of awareness campaigns need to be done among the girl child, but also the boy child should be focused, to be targeted, you know, and the men should be targeted. You know, so because they are the ones perpetrating this violence, but we leave them out and we focus on the girls only. When we make them aware, that they, they would, you know, will reduce, you know, gender issues, gender inequality issues, and violence against the girl child. So, how do you talk to the parents? Because it, it should actually start from the home. Yeah, the parents. We have to find a way of reaching parents in their workplaces. You know, uh, you know, but then we are working towards the future. So we can reach parents in their workplaces, evaluate your decision all through, like what you're doing now, parents are watching. So social media, mass media was an excellent way of reaching out to parents. But we are taking a futuristic approach to it so that at least we are sure that in the future we will have less, you know, incidences of violence against the girl child. That's why we're looking at catching them young, you know, the boys, they grow up with the knowledge that this is not right, this is not acceptable. This is criminal, then the future will be better. But in the moment, like I said, using social media and mass media like radio, television, that's the best way to target um, the parent population. And not ensuring that people who perpetrate violence and all form of discrimination and violation of the, uh, girl, the rights of the girl child, that they are prosecuted. That will serve as a deterrent mm -hmm. to other perpetrators. You know, majorly, you know, we have a problem with the legal system. Uh, with the policing system and you know i i work in collaboration with uh, founding partners at unfpa so we are doing a lot of awareness campaigns with the police and other first responders for them to be aware of what exactly uh violence against the girl child constitutes what are the rights of the girl child and to ensure that they change their their orientation from what it used to be yeah so that's it we're working with them we're trying to change the value of the police first responders uh, and doing all, all of that. Mm. 
I like the sound of changing their um, initiative or their, uh, their thoughts. Now, girls and women from across the world are demanding that politicians recognize their power and open, safe, inclusive and sustainable pathways to political participation. But then, you recall how the gender equality or the gender equity bill was recently thrown out and uh, spoken ill of by some members of the National Assembly, those that you should call um, the he for she's. But so how mm -hmm. will the opposite sex even relinquish their position or is it just paying lip service or are the girls and the women, are they supposed to take it by force, either by way of protest or so? Exactly. And if you remember, at the time that that bill was thrown away, there were protests around the country. Yes. That was what we could do. And we did that. We, we led, um, uh, what they call it now, we went to the House of Assembly. We did a lot of advocacy. It's taken it by force. Definitely, a patriarchal society favors the male, the masculine gender. They're not going to give up what favors them that easily. So we have to take it by force. That's why we continue to work, doing our 16 days of activism, doing a lot. We just need to continue to work to create awareness, work to, you know, find ways of more or less compelling them to give us, we are demanding for our rights. Mm. You know, we are demanding for it because it is our right. What they fail to understand is we have fundamental human rights like the males, you know, and it's fundamental, it is that we are demanding. We are taking it by force. So we are taking steps, like I said, a lot of advocacy to policy makers, a lot of advocacy to lawmakers, you know, and insisting, and then right now, on, on a smaller scale, if I may say, we are trying to ensure that the perpetrators also get prosecuted, you know, that these laws are not just passed, but they are being acted upon, they are being implemented. That's what okay. we're trying to see. But it's a, we, are, we are far away off, and actually throwing away that bill took us like decades back, mm. you know. But what do we do? We're fighting, and we keep fighting. Mm. Awesome. And this year, we commemorate the 10th year, uh, 10th year anniversary of the International Day of the Girl Child, which you actually say that it's, I mean, uh, would you actually say that after 10 years, anything has changed with regards to welcoming girls to important decision making forums, responding to their asks and starting from the family tree down to the public, be it school or the government are we doing enough because now you have parents who or moms who would um, ask the boys go and play football while the girls be in the kitchen how much have we been able to change that um, psyche it's a gradual process like i said it's all about value women. so it's happening i have an experience where someone was asking for a sister he had a boy and a girl who had to write why and he said since she didn't have enough money she was enrolling the boy and the girl was to wait. And that's a typical, you know, African society for you. Mm. The male, they're giving preference. But we are changing that. We are talking to the parents, like uh, on, on our social media handles, we are doing a lot of, you know, uh, awareness campaigns to let the parents know that. Look at uh, Dr. Dr. Kondiwela. Look at uh, Malala Yousafzi. It's Yousafzi. I, can't, I don't know if I got that right. You know, look at Greater Thunberg. Girls are doing a lot the world over. And our girls, given the opportunity, will take the world by storm, by storm, you know, we just need to be given the opportunity. So we've been pushing, we've been pushing and creating awareness. It's a slow and a gradual process, but we're definitely making some movements, you know, definitely making some movement, at least as with regards to education. There's some improvements in the figures, the enrollment of the girl child over the years, over the decade, but then, like I said, there's still a lot more to be done, okay. yeah, because there's still a gap, a wide gap, you know, between the boy child and the girl child, and we intend to bridge that gap, but it needs to slow me. Mm. I hear you keep saying we, we now. To mark the 10 years anniversary of IDG, there's a call to action indicating that girls are ready for a decade of acceleration forward. And it is time for us to all stand accountable with, with, with and for girls and to invest in their future that believes in their agency, leadership and potential. Now, if you keep saying we, UN is saying we, everyone is saying we, who are the we's that should be on this round table? And how do we jumpstart that, not just the conversation, but the action? Everyone should be involved in this course, you know. Uh, but then we're talking about the government, policymakers, the lawmakers. When I say we, major, majorly, it's um, non-governmental organizations. They seem to be taking the lead in this fight, but it shouldn't be that. So it's everyone that needs to act. There's still more laws, more bills to be passed in favor of the right of the girl child, and we need to see that that is done. There's still need to increase investment 
in the P2Es, the pathway to employment, because that's been seen as one of the major ways to better the lot of the, the girl child, you know. So we need a lot of investment in the like six pathways that were created, that were um, identified in formal education, in uh, skills development, and then in employment, including entrepreneurship, including, you know, um, uh, 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 remote working, you know, and then talking about safety of the girl child that is paramount because without safety, we can't do much, you know, talking mm -hmm. about safety of the girl child, talking about adolescent reproductive health, you know, we need investments in this, you know, tech education that mm -hmm. ensures that you can stay in your home, you know, as a girl child and learn. If it's not safe out there because, you know, actually COVID-19 really drew us back, mm. you know, COVID-19. And then we have humanitarian crisis. We have the economic crunch at the moment. All of these are against the, 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 the odds are against the girl child, if you look at it. But there are investments, direct investments that will yield returns, like I said, investing in the P2Es, talking about education, talking about um, ed tech, so that wherever you are as a girl child, you can assess education. You know, talking about skills development, skills uh, that are transferable, you know, okay. employment specific skills. You understand me? Not just going to school is not just enough. So we need to ensure that the girl child is empowered. Specific skills, because right now there's a huge online market there. There's a huge opportunity, you know, online. But girls can assess it without the ed tech can be educated, without the infrastructure and the facilities. So we need all of that, and the first people who need to act, policymakers and the government, they need to increase um, allocations for this kind of um, projects that will better, better the right of the girl child. You know, when the, the budget is being drawn, they need to ensure that uh, the girl child is well accommodated as mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming, mm. when budget is being drawn and beyond. You know, drawing the budget, there should be implementation. So that's where it starts from, from the budgeting, from making policies. But then everyone, the parents, need to act, you know. And when we go to have these talks with uh, parents, you see how unaware they are. So the level of awareness is still low as to what constitutes the right of the girl child, as to what constitutes gender-based violence. People still are unaware. So we need to still continue creating this awareness. We need to ensure that our schools are gender-friendly in many schools, especially in you know, the low and medium, medium income societies, mm. they still do not have a special sex toilet, they still have a mm. unisex toilet. That's not in favor of the girl child, mm. you know, because you know how, you know, uh, mischievous these adolescent boys can be, and then you put them in the same toilet facilities. So we need to ensure that we have safe spaces for the girl child. We have, um, you know, in the workplaces, they have policies that can ensure that the, the, the woman you know, because it, from they being girls to when they grow up to women, they need to be provided opportunities to excel, to maximize their potentials. Every all hands need to be on deck. This work should not be just for the non-governmental and not-for-profit organizations. It is not their responsibility. We are only helping them. So the government should rise up and take its place. Parents, uh, schools, uh, private institutions, a lot of uh, public-private partnership would do us a lot of good, you know. Uh, providing, mm. providing economic, soft economic loans for the girl child, you know, to be, become entrepreneurs and all of that. So there's a lot that can be done mm. by public sector, the private sector, policymakers, the government, and then the NGOs have been doing a lot and will continue to do, you know, to do their bit. Mm. Awesome. Now, there's because you mentioned the COVID-19, there's a, according to a particular um, research and statistics that I, I saw, it states that up to 10 million girls will be at risk of child marriage. The, the profound effect of um, COVID-19 pandemic are putting girls at higher risk of early marriage due to a combination of both economic sh um, shocks, um, school closures, and interruption in reproductive health services. Now, how do we curb these anomalies, especially for those tribes and culture that believe in child marriage, even the so-called elites from that region, and there's little or nothing that anyone can do about it. That's what they feel. Even when there are laws, because of the poor implementation, you know, the laws, but mm. they are not being implemented, yeah, COVID-19 has done us a lot of harm. Schools shut down, especially in some other parts of the world. You know, lack of access, like you said, to adolescent reproductive health issues. Um, I think that, you know, it's still educating the parents to know the negativities of marrying 
we get to up on them we need to implement because there are some states where there are laws against child marriages you know like in my state there are policies we just need to ensure implementation we just need to in fact there was a remarkable um uh, advocacy we carried to a particular community in you know, Bali, we are in Crossover State, where the, the, what they call money wives, you know, is very prominent. Young girls are given off to settle loans mm. and they go there not just to serve the man, but also to bear the economic brunt of that family. But we carried out advocacy to the chiefs, local chiefs, and with the help of the primary ruler in Bali, we were able to abolish the money wives. Uh, uh, syndrome, whatever I want to call it, you know, bandit. So awesome. most of these things do not really work by force, but through advocacy, through working with um, local stakeholders, like the churches, like the mosque, like the chiefs, working with them directly actually yields better results. So to stop uh, child marriages, I recommend that for other communities, they should tell, imitate uh, the urban legal model. It works. So right now, the chiefs themselves, the locals themselves, are campaigning against child marriages. Is working for us real good right now. So that's um, a, a style that can be copied for implementation in other places. I know, particularly in the north, we need more needs to be done in mm. the north. Mm. I hope that we can work with uh, the locals and achieve some landmark. Yeah. Success. Awesome. Awesome. Now, there's another statistic that shows that girls are primarily victims of sexual exploitation. About 72% of detected girls' victims. Um, it actually shows there and then. Um, it also um, states that, let me take um, the quote from here, it says 72% of detected girls' victims, while boys are mainly subjected to forced labor, that's about 66% of detected boys' victims. Now, let's talk about girls' vulnerability to rape and sexual harassment. It's been there over time. And when such happens, mm -hmm. the first question that some people will want to ask is, what was she even doing there at the time of the rape? Or what was she wearing? Mm -hmm. We've even seen so many cases of pedophiles, uncles raping their nieces under the same mm -hmm. roof. And then you have worst case scenario where even the madam or the woman or the wife of the house, she knows about all these things. But then she decides to turn blind eyes to it and instead decide that she would just protect her husband for either selfish, financial, socioeconomic, or whatever reason they gave, leaving the poor girl to hang and dry. As, now, aside all of this, how do you deal with this? Well, like you said, the major problem we have with gender-based violence is lack of reports of incidents because the incidents we report now are less than, you know, just a tip of the iceberg of what is really going on. And until an incident is reported, it cannot be attended to. Yes, there are these issues. The, 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 the girl child is generally vulnerable. The boy is physically stronger. He's built to be stronger. His hormones, you know, support his physical strength. And so easily he can overpower the girl child and do what he likes. But then the society has to say no to this. You know, like I said, if there's a whole lot more of... Um, prosecution that would deter is young they need to understand the girl child has a right people based on what she wore now mm. what do the men wear the men wear go out bare chested nobody questions them but should the girl go out bare or sagging their to pants you complain? and they tell you that the men are moved by what they see who told them that women are not moved by what we see women are better at exercising self-control because society has taught us that we need to teach our men to exercise restraint and self-control and this starts from bringing up the child in the very early years. So a lot, a lot of these parents need to learn a lot. By the time you give the child everything the child asks for, the child sees the woman he desires, he also feels that he's entitled without needing the consent of the woman, and that's really wrong. So we need to let the, the whole world know that no means no. If a girl is saying no, she's saying no. Whatever she wears is her body. She has the right to wear whatever she wants to wear, just the same way the boy child or the male has the right to wear whatever they want to wear. Wherever she goes, whenever, nothing gives anybody any excuse to violate the rights of a girl child or a woman, as, a, as the case may be. So we need to keep putting this out there. No means no. Whatever she wears, even if she goes out stark naked, it's on her. It's her body. She can do with it whatever she wants. And whatever she does does not give you any right to tamper with her rights, you know. Because the right of any other person stops where the right of another begins. Mm. So we need to preach this message as much as possible. And for women out there. That's just opportunity to say to you that they are getting it all wrong. I mean, you owe, you're protecting an adult over a child. The man is an adult. He chooses 
and is aware of his actions, he chooses to rape a girl child, and you sit down there protecting him. You have no duties to protect any man. What are you protecting anyway? The girl child, who is a minor, who is a, has less strength, who is the one that should be protected. And any woman protecting the husband, whether now or in the later future, there's going to be a boomerang. You mm. cannot, you cannot protect him. You know, you should not focus on protecting the girl child that's vulnerable, not the man. He has chosen his actions. He should pay the price. I don't know how best to say this, but I mean, this is wrong, wrong, wrong. Any woman out there, the major things they're protecting themselves is stigmatization. They don't want the world to hear what is happening. And then also, that's why we have to increase our economic opportunities for the women, because most of them, they have nowhere to go because they are handicapped, economically handicapped. They choose to remain in these situations. Most times when we see cases of gender-based violence, the question is, where do I go from here? I'm not earning any income. I don't have where to stay. And so, because the, the options are few for the women or for the girl child, it forces them to remain in abusive situations. So we have to increase opportunities for employment, for economic empowerment of the girl child and of women. That right. would change a lot in our society. Hmm. I like the part where you said it's all shades of wrong. Exactly. Now, aside this uh, human rights violations that we've discussed earlier, there are still other harmful practices subjected to the girl child in particular that are widespread and persistent despite near um, universal condemnation. Practices such as um, virginity testing to breast ironing, the female genital mutilation. Dr. Blessing, with all these shouts and advocacies and uh, discussions and condemnation, these are still prevalent, cutting across countries, cultures, religion, ethnicities, and socioeconomic levels, even religion, and so forth. How do we really deal? Well, I, it's, it's really um, it's a hard one. In fact, I was surprised to learn that in Scotland, child marriages exist. You know, so it's not something limited to just developing countries. Uh, we, we still have a lot to do. Female genital mutilation is barbaric. And we need to understand that we are reducing ourselves to mere animals when we do these things. And then mm. what about the risks associated? Maybe we need to blow the trumpet on the risks associated, but who cares? Mm. Because in most instances, because I don't know, they consider the girl child as less human. In these communities, in these communities where the practice is, they don't care about the outcome for the girl child. If you see what some girls go through in the name of uh, female genital mutilation, oh, for, uh, testing, you would, you would, it's, it's horrific. Hmm. So I, we, we, we can't but just continue to campaign, continue to talk to them, continue to attempt to change their belief system, their values, to incorporate, you know, the proper values. That's what we can do, you know. And like we said, passing laws, passing policies and laws and implementing them. It's, it's, it's crazy what's going on right now. And then that's why we're empowering the girl child tomorrow. I'll be in an all-girl school to speak to them because they can resist. Look at Malala. They can resist. And when they say no and when they demand for their rights, they can also they can promote change. So we're actually bringing the girl child into the action for change, you know, the action against gender inequality. And if they do not know, they cannot act. So we are doing a lot of um, awareness. Tomorrow, like I said, I'll be in FGC Calabar, an all-girls uh, federal school, to speak to the girls on, you know, their rights and on the gender-based violence. Let them know what their rights are in the first place. That's the first level of empowerment. When they know their rights, they can now demand for their rights. So mm. we'll continue to do the things that we can, hoping that someday we'll get to every woman, every man out there, and someday these gender inequalities and issues of gender-based violence will be a thing of the past. We hope mm. so. Hopefully. Now, before we let you go, let's talk about girls who are disabled, be it physically, um, socially, mentally, and otherwise. Because you know that mm. there are girls who have been, who have gone through rape or victim of kidnap. For instance, some of the um, girls from the Chibok school girls that were kidnapped or the Dapchi girls that were rescued, or those who are still in their captor's nest. And ha have we uh, uh, some of them have even been married off. How do we re-socialize uh, these girls or conscientize them and make them understand that regardless of whatever they have been through or they are going through, like the th um, theme for this year's International Day for the Girl Child that says your time is now, it is your right, your future that really matters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, first of all, we have to emphasize the vulnerability of the disabled mentally challenged to physically disabled, they are really more vulnerable. And the society needs to look out for them, not to, uh, you know, break them, you know. I had an instance of um, 
a mentally challenged, she has schizophrenia, that kept coming to Agenda Based Violence Center every day with abuse, physical, sexual. We had to, you know, provide a shelter for her to secure, to, you know, protect her. That's what we need to do for these disabled people. But what we can do actually after they've gone through trauma, they need therapy. And that's one thing the Nigerians need to open up to. There's a whole need for psychotherapy. They're going to get psychological help, going to a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist or a psychologist does not mean you're mad. Most mm. of the issues that psychologists and psychotherapists deal with are adjustment issues that can affect anyone. So we need to be more accepting, more open to therapy. So when someone has gone through trauma, like you said, the only way to make them know that they're still human and that they can still succeed in spite of what they've suffered, that what they've suffered is in the past, and they can still maximize their potentials, is taking through them through therapy, providing therapeutic support for them, providing trauma healing for them, because some of them have been traumatized who experience post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. Some of them are going through complex trauma and it affects them. They need therapy to overcome all this and still live normally and be reintegrated in society. Uh, psychosocial support and uh, trauma response is very, and then we even have not so many practitioners. You know, that's why we need to upskill and upskill for our therapists. And we must ensure that these girls have access to therapy. That's more or less the only way. That's more or less the part because a lot of girls are living with a lot of trauma. Mm. Lot, their troubles, when they, re they identify you as a practitioner, they trust, they come, they are, my DM is flooded. My DM is flooded with girls making requests. And you don't want to hear what some of these girls have gone through. It's, it's, oh, wow. it's terrible. So, yeah, we need to ensure that we give them access to therapy. And that's something government can do. So we need more uh, free uh, psychosocial and therapeutic services for this kind of people. Because they come to you, most times they cannot pay, you know, and mm. nobody supporting you. You need to, and you need to, you, you need to support yourself. So I've done a lot of free therapy, and I got to a point I was like, oh, how much? For how much longer can you do this? You need to also put your own bills. So government should find a way of subsidizing and making available psychotherapeutic services, psychosocial support services to girls who have suffered trauma, to these uh, disabled people in the society to help them heal and be reintegrated into the society. Awesome. But before we let you go, let's let, get your last word, even as we commemorate IDDG um, for uh, 2022. Yes, I'm saying to every young girl out there, your time really is now. Ensure that you do everything to demand your rights in every situation that you are. Maximize your potentials. There's nothing stopping you but yourself. Do not let anyone stop you. And for the society at large, Supporting the girl child, investing in the girl child is an investment that definitely yields humongous returns. So we have to invest to better the plight of the girl child. Look at Ngozi uh, Okonjo Iwela and the likes of her. You know, if we empower the girl child, I mean, we'll have a better society, a better future. So let's invest in the girl child and let's say no to gender-based violence, no to rape, no to all forms of gender inequality. You know, let's ensure equal rights and equal opportunities for the girl child. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. That uh, last word just actually brought chills down my spine. It's been a wonderful time having this talk with you, Dr. Blessing and Tamo. Thank you, you so much for your time. Here. And we do wish you, you all the best. Time. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day ahead. Awesome. All right, viewers, we'll go on a quick break. And when we return, we have um, Zichat Noro. She is, I hate to use the word disabled, but she's a girl. And she need these words. We'll be right back after this time out. Join us again. There are so many challenges. First of all, there is emotional uh, 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 challenge because in the course of everything, uh, the father left us, so I was left as a single mom to cater for her. Did she leave because um, of this? Yes. Wow. Because he didn't want us to continue with the child this way, but I said, I'll keep her. Oh my God. So he left. So I was left to get her for her alone. And so being a single mom, a working mom, it has not been easy. Even though I'm tired, I'll still have to carry her. And then you see your child struggling every day. The pain of seeing your child struggling every day and you can't do anything about it. It's, it's, it's overbearing. And then the financial implications. You know, 
we have to buy diaper she doesn't feed on regular family diet because she cannot swallow solids so she takes only liquids and then uh diaper you know the comp the uh, wearing of diaper for over how many years now 11 years sometimes she develops a bed so because of the diaper Lider. yes nappy rash all these yeah. ones but then once in a while it comes it goes it comes and goes as i was walking towards the crowd with her some two women came and dragged me back that like, you don't carry this kind of women. child yes you don't carry this kind of child to the public the word this kind of child hit me so hard i went back and wept. Oh. welcome back if you just joined us this is the conversation we're reaching you from kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital abuja now we're having our next chat. We have um, Linda Dong. She is the mom to Zit Chat Noro. And we'll be, we're still commemorating International Day of the Girl Child 2022. It's good to have you on the show again, ma'am. Thanks for having me on the show. Great. Awesome. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm no, fine. I mean, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Awesome. Thank you. I like to hear that. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. And how is Zit Chat? She's doing great. We're pulling through. Mm. She's doing great. So now, according to um, UN statistics, it says every minute more than 30 women are seriously injured or disabled during labor. However, those um, 15 to 50 million um, women generally go unnoticed. Now, briefly walk us through your childbirth journey with Zichat. Okay um uh, pregnancy was uneventful normal pregnancy um i conceived uh, twins i was conceived of twins so uh during the antenata like in the third towards the third <coughs> trimester i was noticed to have developed what we call pregnancy induced <coughs> hypertension Pregnancy induced hypertension is could be deadly if not well managed for the mom and the child for the mom and the child Okay, so during the course of the pregnancy when I was diagnosed I was um, Closely monitored until I got to what we call preeclampsia. That means there is protein in the urine and it could be fatal for the mother and the child so while the children were not them they had to book for a c-section so the children can be removed prematurely to save the mother and the baby because mother could develop what we call eclampsia where she'll be having fits seizure like fits and it could be deadly because it could reduce placenta supply to the baby baby could die in utero so um caesarean section was booked early children were pre uh, babies were premature but what happened was there was crisis, there was curfew, and there was strike. The government hospitals were on strike. So we had no option than to go to a private hospital, which I am not sure they had neonatal facilities. So after the C-section, mother was fined. But along the way, two days later, uh, the two babies were noticed to have developed what we call joined this. Uh, neonatal join this usually neonatal what's the cause of joy join this join this is the free flow of uh, destroyed red blood cells in the uh, baby's body that presents itself as yellowish discoloration on the skin the conjunctiva and the mucus lining of the mouth usually what happens is in premature children the liver is not developed when there is excessive destruction of red blood cells the liver is the main organ that conjugates like captures those red blood cells and store them not allowing them to flow freely because they could be deadly if allowed to flow freely in the bloodstream so because they were premature liver was not developed so the only way to manage that is to what we call phototherapy either put the children to a light or do what we call exchange blood transfusion and then giving of glucose to supply energy because the babies will be weak so but because that hospital didn't have neonatal facilities and there was strike there was nowhere to go to 
um, we were referred to another private hospital that had uh, neonatal facilities. But during this spreads rapidly in newborn babies. So before we could get to the private hospital that had the neonatal facilities, the other babies, the second baby's bilirubin level had gone high. She did not survive till afternoon she passed. Wow. Zichard had to go through the theater. She had what we call EBT, total EBT, like removing of her blood and putting another one. After two days, the bilirubin level was still high. They removed the blood, put another one. But in the course of it, nature has made it in such a way that not everything crosses, crosses through to the brain. But if the bilirubin level is too high and gets to cross to the brain, it could cause damage. And we call that one kenic terrors. And that was exactly what happened to her. The bilirubin level got so high, it crossed the brain barrier and then affected a part of the brain, thereby wow. leading to what we call kenic terrors, uh, cerebral palsy. And then other complications will be manifesting as the child grows. So, what other manifestation? Because I, I know you said she's she's eleven. Yes, she's eleven. She'll be twelve by March next year. Oh wow! <laughs> so, what other uh, manifestations have you seen over time? Yes, uh, she had seizures. She was having seizures as a fit, and that one has been taken care of because we go to hospital regularly to see the the neurologist and then they placed her on what we call anticonvulsants and other medications and then she's spastic that's the body becomes stiff at a time and then you see her having spasms that one is that, is that does it come like once in a while or is, is it just yes she has to be on drugs without those drugs she will be spastic as it is now we have to give the medication before we came here if not so that's she, why it's free yes that's why she can even relax oh, if not, wow the body becomes very stiff and you could see the muscles twitching mm -hmm. and that can be very painful. painful and then she cries all through so she has to be on those medications and then over time too she has developed contractures like the legs have twisted they are not aligning the bones have just form a cough an abnormal cough just because she lies down throughout the only carry her to feed and change diaper and others mm. now i know that it can really be draining and exhausting being a career mom and also catering to a child with special need so tell us what kind of challenges have you had to go through and how have you been able to deal with them yeah there are so many challenges first of all there is emotional uh, 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 challenge because in the course of everything uh, the father left us so i was left as a single mom to cater for her did he leave because in... of this yes wow because he didn't want us to continue with the child this way but i said i'll keep her oh my god so he left so i was left to cater for her alone and so being a single mom a working mom it has not been easy you know there is physical stress i come back from work very tired thank god i have a sister who stays in has agreed to stay in to take care of her mm. she does very well she's her second mother mm. always she knows the medication she knows what to do mm. even when i'm not around that's why i can comfortably go on night duty come back and i don't mm. have any fears Mm. I come back tired, you see her crying, maybe the auntie is trying to do one thing or the other. Even though I'm tired, I'll still have to carry her. And then you see your child struggling every day. The pain of seeing your child struggling every day and you can't do anything about it. It's, it's, it's overbearing. And then the financial implications, you know, we have to buy diaper. She doesn't feed on regular family diet because she cannot swallow solids mm -hmm. so she takes only liquids so how do you pass the <coughs> liquid through she takes she drinks tea and then you make golden money you make it very soft add plenty water she can take that one she can take pap she can take um 
liquid. The she yogurt. poo. Yeah, she poos. There was a time she was having constipation. Constipated because she was not getting fiber from her diet until we introduced goldie Mon, i think that resolved the issue and sometimes that means you have to select your foods yes you have to and she doesn't get enough nutrients because most of these foods she's feeding on are processed foods yeah. so you don't get so she doesn't get those natural nutrients that will sustain her she's not thriving well she's been losing weight recently and recently she developed anemia too wow so the challenge medications are very expensive you know you have to buy the drugs without the drugs she cannot go a day without those drugs so not even a day not even a day so not even a day three times a day she has to take those medications so it's 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 really overbearing and then uh diaper you know the comp the uh, wearing of diaper for over how many years now? 11 years. Sometimes she develops a bed sore because of the diaper. Lider. Yes, nappy rash, all these mm. ones. But then once in a while, it comes, it goes, it comes and goes. Now, girls and women of all ages with all form of um, disability are, are generally among the more vulnerable and marginalized in the society. So we were told. So have you been have you ever faced any form of stigma of going out with um, Zit? Yes. I've experienced one or two. And um, one that I can recall, we went for an occasion, went for a party. And as I was walking towards the crowd with her, some two women came and dragged me back. That you don't carry this kind of women. child. Yes. You don't carry this kind of child to the public. The word this kind of child hit me so hard. I went back. I wept. And then we have friends who, when they invite children for a birthday party or so, I feel they don't want us to go because of her condition. They stigmatize. They don't want this child with disability to go to where their children are. And then sometimes when you see a crowd of children, maybe a children's program, the Sunday school, and the church, anywhere, you see children gathered around, they want to see, why is this child like that? Sometimes it's, it's, it's not a pleasant feeling. Anymore. Have you ever thought of deciding that, okay, maybe I should just leave her at home? Has that ever deterred you? No, never. No. I always, if I have the opportunity, I always want to carry her wherever I'm going, even though it's not easy because, you know, you need, you need to carry her wherever you're moving from the car, you know, from the car to where you're going to sit. And then you end up sitting down when people are standing, you can't stand up. You can't participate in whatever they are doing because you just carry her sitting down there. But that never made me for one day to ever say, I don't want to go with her. I always want to go with her. Awesome. Now we understand that less than 5% of children and young persons with um, disability have um, access to education and training of which girls and young women face significant barriers to participating in social life and development, just like you've stated. Now, do you have, are there any kind of um, lesson or home tutor or teacher that you have for ZIT and let's start with that first do you have any kind of home lesson how do you teach her because i remember we, before we started you said uh, when she sees you she greets you good evening yeah. and she knows how to say thank you after every meal she knows how to say sorry yeah. mom how do you manage to do all of that yeah she because of um we relate with her when you have a child that has a disability or when you stay with people that have a disability you devise a means of communication and i think that's what we've been able to do okay she doesn't voice out words but her actions we know a lot we have been able to identify when she's hungry how she do that she, what, what? when she's hungry she made she makes gestures okay or maybe she wants to drink water she will do you know she's either hungry or she wants to drink water and uh, when she's watching a channel and you change the channel she cries whoa until you put that particular channel she wants to watch wow she keeps quiet and if she's uncomfortable too 
she cries. And when we are gisting in the house, when we say something funny, or maybe the sister just say one word, maybe a wrong English word, she will laugh. She will laugh at the <laughs> sister. So I believe wow. she, she understands. And um, we don't have any lesson teacher for her. Unfortunately, this country, they, they've been talking about inclusive mm. education. That's mm. getting children mm. with special needs to be in the same school with children that don't have any special needs should i call them normal children with those that have special needs unfortunately it's, that is not possible in this country you find out that some parents would want to withdraw their child from a school if you have children with special needs mm. in those schools so there is no inclusive education for them but there are special schools that one can enroll them which are very few and very expensive some are owned by individuals I think the ones I know are owned by individuals and uh, the one that is owned by the government too. For a child like her, when you put her in that school, you need a special caregiver attached to her because some other children can take care of themselves, go to toilet by themselves. She needs someone to carry her, feed her, change diaper, turn her, even positioning on bed. You need to mm. turn her. If not, she will lie down on one side throughout the day. So what we and that do, could affect her later. Yes, it gives uh, what we call pressure so. So what happens is what we do at home is we use um, we call them educational channels where you can put uh, some educational ch uh, channels on the television. Okay. She watches where children are singing rhymes when they are they mm. are teaching. You know, I don't know whether she does understand, but. I don't know of what benefit that will be to her anyway because I believe she might not be able to go to school. So that's the only one we do. Oh wow. Since she cannot communicate verbally. Mm. Now uh, women with um, disabilities of all ages often have difficulty with um, physical access to health services. So have you ever experienced any kind of difficulty uh, assessing any form of health care service even though I know that you are a nurse? Um no i wouldn't say yes because the clinic or the hospitals that uh, most hospitals have special units for people with disabilities so okay. they don't go to go to get to go to the general clinic or unless if there are issues they can come to the general clinic but they go to their own particular neurology clinic where they are seen and they have not had any issue going to those clinics uh, most times i notice that most women that come to those clinics have issues with medication. Sometimes the drugs are not even available in the hospital. Mm. So you have to go around looking for them. So and you have a particular place where you always get her drug? Yes. I I have been able to identify one pharmacy that and, and I discussed with them and they are ready to always make the drug available so, so far i agree to be buying from them so that's where i go to regularly if not i'll end up walking around the streets of abuja looking for some of the drugs mm. and they are not available so women who have special needs are not stigmatized in hospitals they get i feel they get normal care like other uh, patients but they could still be vulnerable mm. Now, have you actually had um, people uh, like moms like you who have children with special needs that you can all go together, drop strength? Because I know how much this can really be exhausting. Mm -hmm. You just hold t hands together and just drop strength from each other. Yeah, unfortunately, I've not been able to meet a group of women. We've not been, I have not been in any group. Uh, of women with children with disability, but I belong to women groups that even though they don't have children with disability, they are always there to support, give you emotional support, they could visit, talk to you, encourage you, support financially, and then otherwise, any way they can. That's the only one, but I have not been any in any group of women with children with disability all right even as we begin to round up what are your future plans for zit i'm 
my future plans. Mm. I could say, if I say I don't have any plans for her, I will not be wrong, but my plans for her is a wish. I wish she could get well. What do you mean if you wish she could get well? What does being well mean? It means she doesn't have... I want to see policy. her walk. Hmm. I want to hear her call me mother. I want to see her go out like other children. Hmm. If possible. Everything is possible. Everything yeah, is possible. I believe. All right, so... We'd like to get your last words, even as we commemorate um, International mm. Day for the Girl Child. Mm. Zit is a girl mm. and she's not disadvantaged. So we'd like you to get your words to mm. parents, mm. moms who have <laughs> children with special mm. needs, and especially fathers, even for those who decide to stay or those who just decide they can't take it anymore. Okay. Um, when you have a child with special needs, I feel it is God's design to let you experience something. Having Z-Chat has opened my eyes to so many aspects of this life. I've learned to hold on. I've learned to love more. And I discovered that wherever I am, I think of her like 24 hours a day. Having a child with special needs is a gift if you look very well. If the father can stay, you have other children and those children will support the one that has special needs. And even up until now, he never called. Nothing. <laughs> not at all. So it's not a good idea to walk away. You could still have other children. Nobody plans to have a child that have a special needs so you hold on you take care of the child love the child those children they know it's unfortunate um a writer someone wrote and i quote that so many innocent blood have been shed because they could not carry on mothers were left with the burden of taking care of children with special needs and they get tired and some will just give up and say let me allow the child to rest or do away with this child and carry on with my life. It's so unfortunate. I'm I am trying to be very careful asking that question. I don't want to ask you that question. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I just want to run away from asking you that question if you've ever at any point had that thought. I'm just trying to be careful. I, I've tried not to ask you. I, yes. But you just brought it up. Yes. Let me not lie to myself. At a point when the pressure became too much, I felt... What am I living for? I struggle every day from morning till night. In fact, there was a day I told myself, I said, okay, what will happen is I will give her something that she will die. Me too, I will drink and then two of us will die and oh, rest. No. It has gotten to that extent, but mm. with, with encouragement, I meet people every day and I'm so fortunate to have so many friends along the way because of her. Somebody sees her today and will look for us tomorrow. I want to see this girl. I want to know the chat. Where is the chat? And that gives me the courage to want to hold on. And I am grateful to God that uh, not anymore. Mm. I want to hold on. I want to carry her to the end. So mothers should. Uh, it's not easy. But just keep holding on. I've had people who have supported me. People who I never knew. The church. The Catholic Church supported me. My colleagues at work supported me. And then my um, women group, people I've never met, who just chat me on Facebook. Can you send your account number? And I want to send something to the chat. It's grace. It's not easy, but it's grace. So let's keep holding on. There's a brighter side at the awesome. end of the day. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and sharing your time with us, Linda Dawn. Mm -hmm. It's been a wonderful time having this talk with you. Thank you. And thank you, Zaid, for coming. For Say hi, mommy. She's tired. <laughs> I can see that. Mm -hmm. All right, viewers. That's where we end this conversation. Thank you so much for tuning in. We have been chatting with Linda Dong. She's Zid Chat Nuru's mom. And it's been a wonderful time here on the conversation. Whatever you do, be it a woman or a, or a man, 
it is if not for anything at least for the fact that we are celebrating international day for the girl child whatever child you see be it this one with special need or the one that doesn't have any need at all please stop the stigma it doesn't do them any good they need all the support or the care that they can get thank you so much for tuning in i'll see you again next time from the nation's capital abuja i am annabelle oji god bless nigeria <laughs>